Uh, I'm happy to give you an update from last year's work on increasing adoption of secure coding standards. Uh, Dan Playkosh was intending to give this talk. He is my team lead, technical team lead on this. Dan is instead taking what I'm going to be talking about and actually helping a Navy customer as we speak deal with a particular uh, situation where they needed to have this kind of analysis done on their code. So the real expert is out doing real work and I'm here to help ex uh, explain the kinds of work and the research that we've done here. I'm Mark Sherman, I'm the technical director for Cybersecurity Foundations. And what that group does, going back to what John Goodenough explained earlier, is look at the security elements of building software, the whole software life cycle. So we call it the secure software development life cycle. So how does security play into requirements analysis, design, and architecture? Again, my team was involved in the project that you just heard about, secure coding, uh, testing, and so on. Oh, used to the copyright slide being there. So in building secure coding, this is about how to actually write code that lends itself to programs that have fewer weaknesses and therefore fewer vulnerabilities. And there's really two aspects to this work. The first is what we call the, um, the fundamentals, the principles of what's involved. And these are the actual rules that we want programmers to follow. They're both prescriptive rules, things you should do, and there are actually a lot of proscriptive rules, things that you should not do. And we'll give you an explanation of some of the advances that we did here in the last year or so. However, having rules by themselves is usually not good enough. You can tell people, do these things. And by the way, these rules number depending on which version you look at, tens, fifties, hundreds. And so they expect programmers to remember all hundred rules and to apply them consistently can be a challenge. And so the other part of the work is how to reduce the friction of adopting these rules. How can we make these rules accessible so they actually get put into practice? So first, the C rules. We've been working on this for quite a while. Uh, since 2006, I just hear different echoes at different places. In 2006, we started working on this and developed this first set of rules. Uh, we do this in a very uh, rigorous process. Uh, we use basically three approaches. The first is that we actually read the language specification. Because most language specifications have places in them that say, and we do not define the behavior of this particular feature. When that happens, we then look to see, OK, what are the different ways it could be implemented and how that might lead to weaknesses and therefore to vulnerabilities, and then develop rules to mitigate those. Second thing we do is we actually look at problems that have been reported. Being at CERT, we have the advantage of seeing what I'll call simply a lot of bad code. And in looking at that code, we can see problems that arose, and then we devise rules that will mitigate those problems. But more than simply doing that, we then take those rules and we look at another body of code. We say, if we applied those rules to this other body of code, did it in fact kick out good programs and miss bad programs? And we iterate this until we get a precise rule that's focused on trying to identify programs that have problems and not programs that don't have problems. And third, we engage the community. We have closer to 1,600 now contributors. We have an open wiki that people can engage in discussions of these rules. And in fact, it's a living document. So a couple of years, we published the second edition. Um, we actually, the first edition was in the ISO standard. The ISO standards are nice. You can put them into procurement documents. But ISO standards are sort of like astronomy. When you're looking at them, you're really looking at history. So it's not really the latest and greatest knowledge of what we know, but we put it through that process as well so that it's more accessible. Um, we are, as I said, continuously updating that. And what I'll share now is a little bit of what we've done in the last year. So first, C itself, we did some updates. I'm not going to dwell a whole lot on those updates. 30 or so rules had to be updated as the C language itself um, uh, got uh, evolved in response to people's use of the language. But C also introduced another computation model, threads. The reason why threads are important 
is because they are the way to efficiently program multi-core systems. So we all know multi-core systems is effectively how architectures have evolved. It's the way to get uh, more bang for the buck for the power. To program those systems, you use some kind of parallel technology. In the case of C, it's threads. We found, when looking at this, there were nine areas of pretty big issues with threads that could lead to weaknesses and vulnerabilities with inter-thread communication and thread-specific storage. And just to give you an example, I'll do a little bit of C. Not a lot, I promise. Not here, at least. Uh, when you're running a thread on one of the cores, and you allocate some memory, you use it, and then it disappears. You're done using the core. What happens to that memory? Well, the standard doesn't say. So just like things like Heartbleed get access to space you're not supposed to be using that ha may have interesting material in it, if that space isn't reclaimed and otherwise cleaned up, it's now available to some other place and now you can start reading information that perhaps that other process ought not to be reading. That's an example of a weakness that can lead to a vulnerability in C threads. The C++ standard, strongly related to C, uh, had major revisions done to it. And so we had some rules. We had to do major overhauls of 60 of those rules. There's about 90 odd altogether. And we also added 24 new rules um, around various areas. Again, we'll talk a little bit more about what some of those areas are. All of this is available on our wiki. And uh, I do not know whether you get access to this material or not. So if you don't copy that URL and you want it, we're happy to get it to you later. Now, having defined these rules, we then need to make it easy for programmers to actually put them into practice. So we did a variety of things here. First, we, what we called improved analyst productivity. And this goes to our observation of the current state of the practice. You can argue whether you like the practice or not, but the current state of the practice seems to be that developers develop their code, and then hand it over to some other organization, some testing organization, or even some security testing organization. They then run a tool like Fortify or Coverity or what have you on it. It generates a couple of tens of thousands of diagnostics. People throw up their hands and say, this is too much, and relatively little happens. But that seems to be how the world works. That analyst who sees the output of, that, um, of those tools is sort of our first target because that's the current practice that we hope to improve first. So the first thing we do is we acknowledge that you probably will get better results with more tools than less tools. You get rid of false negatives that way. Tools only report things they find. They don't talk about things they don't find. More tools, you find fewer things. That makes worse the problem of having too many diagnostics. And so we deal with that by filtering out those diagnostics which don't have to do with security. You know, do your begin and end align on the same column? That's checked by the tools, not really relevant for security. We then also recode all of the rules into one canonical form so that you can see the kinds of things that programmers actually need to fix and what they need to fix. That's going into the rules. And then we collect them together so you see them all combined together. So you see the source code and then all the rules that were affected from all the tools on that code. And then finally, as the analyst reviews these, it's still going to be the case that there are problems that are not really, pro there, sorry, diagnostics that aren't really problems. The way we deal with that is the analyst will then say, this one's OK. It looks bad, but I know from context that it really is OK. We remember that because development is an iterative process. So when you run the system again, it remembered that you already saw this one, you already dealt with it, and doesn't bring it to you again uh, for you to reevaluate. And therefore, we improve the productivity of the analyst. We estimate, and this is purely anecdotal, we did not run human studies, we'd like to, but we haven't, uh, that we get maybe a tenfold increase in analyst productivity, and we're looking at some other things that make that even better. But that's still adding it at the end of the process. We think you get more bang for the buck moving it earlier into the development process. You saw the chart that John Goodenough put up. The earlier, the faster you find things, the cheaper and faster it is to fix. And so we've adopted a method to provide immediate feedback to the developers. We take a look at the integrated development environments that programmers are using. 
and we have them check the rules as the programmer is writing code. So in the same way that these systems currently check, you have semicolons in the right place, or begins and ends match, braces match, you can check for these violations as the programmer is programming them. The advantage, first of all, is that it's immediate. A lot of times to understand what's going on, you need context. That analyst, two weeks later looking at code, doesn't have the context of what's being written. The programmer who just wrote the code knows exactly why they did it, and if it's in fact something that should be allowed, they can immediately say so and get rid of the argument completely. Second of all, because they have the context, if it is a problem, they can fix it right away. Third, if in fact there's a problem and they fix it, and it happens a second time or a third time, the developer gets feedback on what is the right way to do it, changes their behavior, and they start writing good code even though they no longer are tripping over these things in the tools. We focused on two particular tool platforms because they're used very often uh, out there in the field. One is uh, the Clang Static Analyzer, which is the basis for many of the C development environments, uh, like uh, Apple's Xcode. And we also focused on FindBugs that goes into things like Oracle's J Developer. We've put the changes that we made into the code trees. We actually are committers in these projects for those who know what that term means. And so we expect the changes that we make will actually get out into the field mm, three to 18 months from now, depending exactly on where you're getting your development environment and how long it takes for them to pick up changes and so on. And just to give you a feeling for some of the changes that we've made, uh, in the C and C++, C++ that's in the <coughs> Clang one, we made changes and checkers on things like exceptions, function returns, constructors, uh, assertions, and evaluating ordering, just to give you a feel for what that might look like. Um, for those who don't know C or don't program, so think happy thoughts for a couple of sentences. For, for the C theologians in the audience, um, you can take a look at, oops. You can take a look at that second line that says B equals size of A++. Um, A++ means that A is supposed to be incremented. But the size of works on types. So A and A++ are both integers. So size of an integer doesn't change at runtime. So as far as the language is concerned, you're allowed to say that's, one, that's a constant, and the A++ never gets evaluated. Or it might try to evaluate it. You don't know. Now if A is being used as an index in an array, now you've got a buffer overflow potential. That's an example of the subtlety, but it's also an example of our difference in philosophy. There are lots of rules that they give the programmers, do's and don'ts. Don't do a buffer overflow. Okay, you know, how am I supposed to know what to do in order not to do a buffer overflow? Rules like this give the programmers very specific advice on how to program that won't lead to buffer overflows. Again, that goes back to our method of looking as to how things went wrong in the past and what you could do to do them better. Okay. Those who are thinking good thoughts can come back, move over to Java. Uh, there we've made changes in the override and I.O. And again, an example here in the Java details for the Java theologians has to do with uh, return codes of bytes. End of files are minus one and integer minus one, but it's reading bytes, and a byte of minus one is not the same as an integer of minus one. One is only eight bits long, one is much longer. If you look at one and then convert it into the other, you will mistakenly see a byte of minus one, the del key, if you like to think in terms of that way, as being an end of file when it's really not. You could either read too far, or not read far enough in a buffer, leaves information behind, or doesn't get the information you want uh, copied or transformed or what have you. Again, a weakness that leads into a vulnerability. These are the kinds of things that we're putting in in order to improve the productivity of programmers and to make it easier for them to adopt these rules. So we have been maintaining the rules and expanding them as the languages themselves expand what they are covering. And as I mentioned, we've developed a whole variety of rules. There are now approximately 100 each for C and C++. We developed this web application that improves the productivity of the analyst. And again, for those who are interested, uh, it was supposed to be released October 1st, failed the final system tests. And the shame on us, we're the Software Engineering Institute, right? We ought to be able to meet the schedules, but I'll take the blame. 
Uh, but in about a week or so, this will be available as well. And we have a couple of places that are intending to get it uh, as soon as we cut the golden CD. Um, and we're introducing uh, these new checkers earlier in the development process. And rather than us sending it out, we're actually using established channels that are already in place for people who pick up these IDEs to pick this up. As I mentioned, we do this as a community project where we encourage people to come in. And so while I'm here, I want to extend that invitation to people here. Uh, we welcome your participation in this process. And it can be either as someone who obtains these standards, someone who wants to learn these standards, someone who wants to contribute to these standards, uh, if you have specific needs. And I gave you the example of the Navy just a few moments ago. We go out and we help people actually apply these in practice to improve code. We do this in many different organizations. We're happy to work with you in that kind of regard as well. <laughs>